All right, so yesterday we started talking about conjugated systems, and we said that conjugated systems are defined as having these alternating double single bonds, and that they've got weird properties. And the example I used was this aldehyde, where we can move the pi bond around, and because of that, this bond down here has some pi bond character, and we said because of that, it doesn't rotate as freely as a normal sigma bond. And we were able to explain this using some MO diagrams where we said, if you draw the MO diagram for these resonance structures, you can see that pi bond character that restricts rotation. And because of that, even in simple systems, there's a barrier to rotation of 15 kcals per mole or larger, um, depending on the substituents. So S transdienes, while they're more stable, aren't as reactive. We need to drive it to that S cis diene conformation to do a lot of unique chemistry. But let's switch gears and talk about the MO diagrams a bit more. I think if you were in Mark Allen's class, you guys talked about MO theory a lot, right? I'm not sure about the other instructors. I've just talked with him about it. MO theory is one of those things where it's as complicated as you make it. Um, you can dive down the rabbit hole of MO theory, but I'm going to explain just kind of the bare bones concept. So let's take a look at our really simple S trans diene. And we said that if you were to draw this using an MO diagram, you'd have these alternating carbon-carbon bonds, each of which has a P orbital. And in this representation that I've got drawn with bond line formula, we've got pi bonds on the ends, right? So in this case, we've got a pi bond here, here. And so these are pretty rigid. They don't want to rotate as easily, but we know that this bond right here can have some double bond character. under certain circumstances. Specifically, if you excite the molecule enough, it will adopt some double bond character. But let's take a look at this MO diagram that I've got down here. You don't need to copy this down. It's in your textbook. But in order to build an MO diagram for conjugated systems, the first thing you need to do is line up all of your carbon atoms that you have. So in this case, we've got four carbon atoms. And then the most stable molecular orbital is where all of those p orbitals are in phase with one another, right? So if you remember, p orbitals have a positive phase and a negative phase. That's represented by the red and blue. They're in phase when all of those colors match. So in this case, we can have all of these in phase. The next highest energy level is when we actually add a phase flip at some point in the molecule. We call this a node. The node, in this case, can be identified with this dotted line right here. So this node's in the middle. And so now we've got two pi bonds on either side, both of which are in phase, but the pi bonds aren't in phase with each other. Does that make sense? And then if we go up one energy level higher, we could say, well, what if instead of one node, we have two nodes? We could have them right here and here. Now we can see this double bond-like character can exist in this higher energy conformation where it has pi bond character. And then if we go up to the highest energy level conformation, we're going to throw in three nodes. So I'm going to draw this here, here, and here. And at this point, there isn't any pi bond character at all because everything's out of phase. This is very energetically unstable at this point, which is why it's the highest point of our energy diagram. So if we think about the number of electrons in our p orbitals, we have four total electrons. So when we're filling out this MO diagram, we're going to go through and we're going to say, all right, we've got one electron, two, three, and then four. We don't have any electrons in these higher energy configurations, though. And we have very, very specific terminologies when we're talking about these energy levels. The energy level with electrons right here is called your HOMO. This is short for your highest occupied molecular orbital. Did you guys learn about this in Gen Chem? Yeah, homo and lumo. About homo and lumo? Okay, so this is an important concept. What's this one called right here? Lumo, right? So it's it's your lowest unoccupied
molecular orbital. Chemists, when we're looking at molecules, all we really are interested in, for the most part, is your HOMO level and your LUMO level, right? Your HOMO level is where those outermost electrons are, the highest energy the reactive electrons are. Your LUMO is the next highest electronic state in your molecule. You can actually excite these electrons from your HOMO into your LUMO state, especially with a lot of these conjugated systems. That's what gives a lot of conjugated molecules color, for that matter. They can absorb light, which is electromagnetic radiation. It will kick up one of these HOMO electrons into your LUMO band, and so it's absorbing light of a certain frequency, right? When you absorb light in the vis visible region, it will appear colored. Um, there are some molecules that only absorb light in the UV region or the IR region, um, but in this case, we're going to be focusing on the visible region. So with what you just said, isn't it when those electrons, because you have one of electrons, but then it's not going to be the same one necessarily that's occupied, but it's, it's when that electron actually gets kicked back down when you see the light, right? It depends. So there's different types with something that's colored. All it's doing is absorbing the light, and then when it relaxes back down, it usually relaxes back down and releases heat. But there are certain situations where when your electron gets excited from your HOMO to your LUMO, it can relax back down and emit a photon back at you. Does anybody know what that's called? Fluorescence and phosphorescence. Fluorescence. Phosphorescence actually involves something a little bit more complicated where you have a crossover. But fluorescence is when you kick an electron up and it will release it back at you um, when it relaxes back down. Um, that's what you guys saw with black lights with your TLC plate. Do you guys remember that? When you shine it with a black light, you're kicking electrons up to a higher electron um, level. And then when they relax back down, you're observing them fluorescing back at you. It's a pretty common uh, phenomenon. So this is a really simplistic view. Let's take a look at a more complicated one. So for this more complicated one, we'll go into a highly conjugated system. And again, just like before, you could say, you know what, there's a bunch of carbons coming off here. All of these have p orbitals. I'm not going to show them in phase or out of phase right now, because we'll talk about that with the diagram. But in my bond line drawing, we've got alternating double single bonds in this highly conjugated system. So now if we do this, same concept applies. We can go through and we can say, all right, lowest energy level, I'm going to zoom out a little bit, has everything in phase down here. There are no nodes. And then if we go up one energy level, we add one node. The one node always starts in the center. And then if we go two nodes, we can add two nodes right here, followed by three nodes, four nodes. Looks a little bit different, but we still have one pi bond. And then five nodes would be at our highest energy level. We can't have six nodes because there aren't enough carbons there, right? So the most nodes you can have is um, the number of carbons minus one. All right, and then if we look at the number of electrons in our p orbital, we had six, right? So just like before, we'd say we've got one, two, three times two. That's six electrons. So in this case, this would be our HOMO, and this would be our LUMO level. One thing you might notice is that when you add conjugation to a molecule, this gap from here to here, let me actually do it in a different color. I'll do it in pink. This energy gap shrinks when you have more and more conjugation. If you only have what we have up here, two pi bonds, that gap between your HOMO and LUMO is going to be larger. When you add in more adjacent conjugated pi bonds, that gap shrinks and gets a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller, a little bit smaller. And so you might actually observe different colored molecules depending on the extent to which they're conjugated, right? So if you guys remember the vitamin A lab when we were extracting beta carotene, that was a lot of alternating double single bonds. That gap is super duper tiny which means it absorbs red light. So, or absorbs light in the visible region and appears red, I should say. So you can predict which compounds are gonna be colorful based on whether or not they have a lot of conjugations because their homo-lumo gap will be quite small. 
We're going to talk about this in more detail later, but I wanted to present this concept because we'll talk about MO diagrams with some of our reactions. Are there any questions so far? All right. <laughs> I don't know if that's good, like you guys understand, or you're like, I have no idea what he's talking about right now. So let's go ahead and talk about a new type of reactivity. We already did addition reactions in chapter 9, but we're going to redo them using conjugated systems. The good thing is these reactions are super duper intuitive. So what I want you guys to do is to help me figure out what the product or products might be for this reaction. And I'll give you guys a hint. Remember resonance. You always want to form your most stable carbocation. How many people are really comfortable with the intermediate? I hope so. <laughs> Right, electrophilic addition. First step is that protonation. And then the main question I have for you guys is the positive charge gonna be here? Or is it going to be on that outermost carbon? The first, one. first one, right? Please don't get that wrong. I'll cry a little on the inside. Why is this such a stable carbocation? Well, for one thing, it's secondary. It's secondary versus primary. Yeah, and it has resonance. This is a super duper stable carbocation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna color code this proton that was added in because this becomes important. I'm gonna say, all right, this proton must have been delivered to that outermost side. And we know that this has a resonance structure where you can move this pi bond over. That doesn't change the position of that proton at all, but it does change the position of the pi bond, and now our positive charge is on that outermost carbon. All right, and we've got Br minus floating around, right? It can attack either one of these intermediates, and we'll talk more about that later, but let's try to draw all the different products we could get out. So for example, if you've got Br minus floating around, it can react with that leftmost resonance structure, or it can react with the rightmost resonance structure. Are we only doing the one equivalent, or can we... Nope, yeah, let's just do one equivalent. So do we agree that these are going to be our major structures? So the leftmost one, we have to consider the mixture of enantiomers because that carbocation is trigonal planar. You can attack from the top lobe or the underneath lobe of that p orbital. And for the rightmost one, it doesn't have any stereochemistry because it's a primary carbocation. Okay, so now the question is, which product is more likely? Or is it more complicated? Okay, so I think you brought up a good question. Which one's the more stable product? Oh. Let's go back to our alkene chapter. Which alkene is more stable? The second one's more stable, right? So this is the more stable alkene. Why is it the more stable alkene? 
Well, it's dye substituted, right? If we look at the one on the left, it's only mono substituted. We know that when we increase substitution on our alkene, we've got increased hyperconjugation. That stabilizes them quite a bit. So more stable alkene. This is our less stable alkene. What about the fact that the intermediate through which the less stable was made was more stable? The intermediate was more stable. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting ahead. All right. What do we call our most stable product? Is it thermodynamic or kinetic? Thermodynamic. thermodynamic. Okay, so I'm going to label this even with more detail. I'm going to say this is our thermodynamic product. I told you guys you'd have to remember term one. All right, so our thermodynamic product is always going to be our most stable product. Our kinetic product, how did we define that? It wasn't necessarily most stable. It's the, it was the activation energy, right? So activation energy is basically saying, how big is that barrier that you have to overcome in order for the reaction to occur? I want to imagine that you're the bromine. Put yourself in the bromine shoes, mm -hmm. or bromide, I should say. Mm -hmm. So in step one, the proton's delivered, right? That means after that proton's been delivered to this site, you're kind of floating around, right? This positive site is really super duper close. If you need to attack this carbon, you've got to float through space to attack that terminal carbon. So just by proximity, that bromide ion is going to have an easier chance attacking the leftmost resonance structure than the rightmost resonance structure. The resonance structure on the right, the bromide actually has to float a longer distance to attack. So that means that the compound on the left, even though it's the less stable alkene, is the kinetic product. And let's make a little note that the Br minus doesn't have to float as far. <laughs> That's a scientific term. to attack your positive center. That means that it's got a lower activation energy. So if we want to favor our thermodynamic product, what should I do to this reaction? Yeah, increase energy, right? We said in term one, if you want to get your thermodynamic product, you just want to blast over either activation energy and favor your most stable product. With your kinetic product, you don't necessarily want your most stable product. You just want to get over the one that has the lowest barrier of activation. So let's kind of review that briefly using our reaction coordinate diagrams. We know one of them is going to give us our product that is more stable. That's the one where the alkene was dye substituted. And then we said that the other pathway, I'm going to do this other pathway in blue, has a smaller activation energy, but gives you the less stable product. And we said that this is going to be our kinetic product. People oftentimes get these confused and they say, that, well, your kinetic product's always going to be your less stable product. That's not how we define kinetic products though, right? Kinetic products are just simply the product that have the lower activation energy. So let's make a note of that. And we said we can favor our kinetic product by lowering the temp a little bit 
and that means that that pathway is going to be slightly more favored than the black pathway. So a little bit of review from last term. There's also some different terminology that's used when discussing these reactions. These are referred to as electrophilic addition reactions or conjugate addition reactions, and you'll even hear the term 1,2 or 1,4 conjugate addition reactions. So let's go and define what it means to be a 1,2 conjugate addition versus a 1,4 conjugate addition. So I'm going to scroll back up a little bit. Is that okay? Okay. A 1,2 conjugate addition is basically saying that your proton and your nucleophile are on carbons 1 and 2, right? Or relatively adjacent carbons. So if we look at this, right, we'd say this proton is one carbon away. So we'd call this a 1,2 conjugate addition or simply 1,2 addition. If we look at the one on the right, you can see that this is 1, 2, 3, 4. They're separated out through space a lot wider. So this would be a 1, 4 addition reaction. People will say, well, does 1, 4 addition always give you the thermodynamic product? The answer is sometimes. You have to check, right? Draw out your reaction mechanism. Look at each of your products and do that thoughtful analysis of whether or not you're forming the more stable alkene or whether or not your bromide or your nucleophile has to travel around to find that carbocation. So I'll give you guys a problem to work on. I, yep. So you said that the bromide is closer to the left one, making it the kinetic, but isn't that also the more stable, which means it's in higher amount in the equilibrium between the resonance structures because it has a, they both have resonance, but that positive charge is not stable. That's a good question. So you're looking at relative contributors for the resonance structure. Anytime you have resonance delocalization of a carbocation, they're both really major contributors. It's not that the one on the left exists in a lot higher concentration or anything like that. It's that there's significant positive character on each of those two carbons, and that bromide can attack either one. Yep. Isn't that just simply because resonance structures aren't actually two separate structures? Just exactly. The delocalization or the overall distribution of the charges between the atoms? Yeah, that's a really good point. It's not that there's a true positive charge. It's that there's delta positive on both of those carbons, and that bromide can pick which one it wants to go after. At low temperatures, it just wants to find the closest one and get the business done, right? At high temperatures, it says, I want to form the most stable product, so I'm going to try to favor the most stable alkene. So I'll give you guys a practice problem to work on. And I want you guys to go through this, identify your products, and then I want you to identify which one's thermodynamic, which one's kinetic, and then I want you to identify it as 1,4 versus 1,2 addition. Let me make sure I'm not picking one from the pod. Okay. I've done that before a few times. I've done it quite a bit, actually. I like it. So HBr. And for this case, I'm going to say I'm going to run it cold. And I'm putting cold in quotes. I want you to predict what your major product will be and what your minor product will be. Do we only do one equivalent of HBr? Yep, only one equivalent of HBr. I'm going to draw out my HBr with colors again so we can keep track of a proton. Does it matter which pi bond we use to do the attack? Mm -hmm. No, because it's symmetric. If you have an unsymmetric molecule, you do have to take that into account. Got our resonance structures.
this what you guys are getting? This is exactly what I got. Exactly what you got? I can tell based on all the writing you're getting. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so which alkene's more stable, the right one or the left one? Right one. That means it's got to be our thermo product, right? Which one's our kinetic product? Yeah, the one on the left, because the bromide's going to be in really close proximity to that carbocation after the protonation event, right? So that means it's going to be our kinetic product. Which one's going to be favored with cold temps? Yeah, so I'd say this one would be our major product. This one will be our minor product. All right, and then which one's 1, 4 versus 1, 2? So which one's 1, 4, left or right? The right. The right. Because the bromine's coming off the carbon that's 4 away, right? So this would be 1, 4 addition. And this would be 1, 2 addition. So, oh my goodness. <laughs> This is embarrassing. It's a good thing I'm not recording myself or anything. All right. So you guys want to do a, a challenge one now? Yes. All right. That one was fairly easy and straightforward, but let's do a challenging one. Oh, my goodness. Let's... See if I can do it better. So this has seven carbons, but not a normal hexagon. <laughs> yeah, seven membered rings are the hardest to draw, far and away. But just do your best. Nine's pretty hard too, actually. So HBR. And I'm going to write hot. <laughs> this is all relative. And I'm going to draw out my skeletons to save some time. Yep, still one equivalent of HBR. I apologize about my terrible structures. Maybe they make you feel better if you're having problems, though. I'm going to clean this up a little. How many of you guys feel like you got this problem? Still working on it? I know this one takes probably longer to draw than to figure out, but. Just so you know, you broke my heart over the units. Why? All right, just to get you guys started, make sure you're not going off into the weeds somewhere. 
let's go ahead and do this first arrow pushing and rule out an option, right? So the question now is, do we want the positive charge on the tertiary carbon position, or do we want it down here? The second one, right? Because resonance trumps, trumps the tertiary position. Students get this messed up all the time, and they're like, tertiary is always better. No, resonance always takes the cake. Oh, there's more to it. Okay, and I'm going to draw in my proton then. Actually, for this one, let's just ignore stereochemistry for right now, because that does complicate things. Okay, are these the products that everyone's getting? Okay. So now we got to go through, just like we did in the previous problem, and identify our thermodynamic product. Which one's our thermodynamic product? The left one, right? Which one's our kinetic product? Left one. Why not the right? It has a higher activation energy. Why? Because it has to go the entire way around that ring. Yeah, if you notice, for the rightmost one, that bromide had to float to the completely opposite side of a seven-membered ring to find the carbocation. That's going to have a huge activation energy. Okay, so that means that the left one is your thermodynamic product and it's your kinetic product. These don't have to be mutually exclusive things. You can have a compound that's both your thermodynamic product and your kinetic product. That means regardless of the conditions that you run this under, you're going to get the one on the left as your major contributor. The one on the right is always going to be minor. This one's going to be your major product. All right, and then which one's 1-4 one addition? One on the, right. the one on the right. So this one's 1-4 one addition. And the other one is 1-2 one addition. So it's thermodynamic because it's a tri-substituted alkene, where the one on the right is only a di-substituted alkene, oh, right? Okay. So you have to look at the substitution of your alkene to de determine which one's thermodynamic. Yep? So does the um, kinetic product have nothing to do with how, um, how stable the, the carbocation is? No, the kinetic product has nothing to do with how stable the carbocation is. It, only has to do with the activation energy, which in this case has to do with how far that nucleophile has to travel before it can find the position it's attacking, right? So if we look at the one on the left, it didn't have to go that far. It was just the next door carbon that it had to attack. That means it's going to be your kinetic product. Or the one on the right had to travel all the way across that seven-membered ring to find its partner. All right, so I think we're going to stop there today, but I would encourage you to start your pod right now with a partner because it's closely related to what we've been working on, but backwards.